Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Uh, today we're going to talk about meiosis one. Okay, we talked last time about kind of an overview of meiosis. And today we're going to talk about a special, well, two, two kind of special or unique events that occurred di during meiosis or meiosis one. And that is one shown here, okay, and that is the event of crossing over where two homologous chromosomes, maybe this one is the paternal chromosome, this is dad's chromosome, and this is mom's chromosome, and they exchange pieces. So you get hybrid chromosomes. And this was first described by Francis Jonathan, and then later written up and so and this is the, we've known about this for a long time, early 1900s, so like 1909 or somewhere in there is when it was first described. And then it was written up by a guy named Thomas Morgan, who we'll talk about again um, when we talk about things like uh, chromosomal migration and stuff like that. So nonetheless, it's, it's been around for a long time, but still... To this day, there are some missing pieces, and we don't know um, some of the players, and we, we actually don't know how to predict whether this is going to occur or not. And we'll get into that, um, because not all chromosomes will cross over at all times, and um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, with age, um, some of these patterns change as an individual ages, and there's lots of information that we don't know about crossing over. But we do know this, it creates a lot of genetic diversity. So we'll jump into that um, a little bit here um, after I go through kind of the phases of meiosis. All right, so meiosis one is divided into four stages and you're really familiar with these stages because they're the same kind of stages that you see in mitosis. So you have prophase one, where the homologous pairs exchange segments through crossing over. You have metaphase one, where homologous chromosomes are lined up on the equatorial plane, the metaphase plate, just like in mitosis. Anaphase one, where the homologs separate and um, move to the poles. And telophase one, where you know new nuclear envelopes start to form around the chromosomes um, at the poles, and and you basically went from one cell to two cells. Now another interesting piece, another piece that um, is important, is a a step in metaphase where these homologous chromosomes are lining up on the equatorial plane metaphase plate. So you have chromosomes, you have one chromosome you know from your father and one chromosome from your mother and they're homologs so they're the same chromosome so chromosome number one we could just pick chromosome number one. Okay? Now where they line up on the metaphase plate is random that's called independent assortment so you know if this is mom's chromosome and this is dad's chromosome, and the line in between the two is a metaphase plate, they could go like this, or they could go like this, and it could go like this through all the chromosomes. And so on one side, you could have, you know, 10 chromosomes from your dad and 13 from your mom, and the other side, you know, you'd have the opposite. Um, this, this is independent assortment, so this is also creates a huge amount of genetic diversity. And we'll talk about that. That's one of the great uh, benefits of sexual re reproduction and meiosis, for that matter, is the genetic diversity that's that's uh, comes from comes about from it. Okay. So let's look at these a little more in depth. So prophase one, those homologous chromosomes are going to line up. They're going to pair up together, and you're going to get crossing over where the inside sister chromatids will exchange pieces. Okay? And they're exchanging the exact same piece. So if it's like the P region, um, 
and maybe you know like the P1 or P2 region of the maternal chromosome is going to break off and it's going to swap with the P1, P2 region of the paternal chromosome. It's going to be the exact same amount of genetic material that's swapping between the two. Now this results in hybrid chromo chromosomes and so when this is inherited if you inherit one of these hybrid chromosomes, which you most likely will, um, you'll have a chromosome with genes from your father on a piece of the chromosome and genes from your mother on the other piece of the chromosome, which you know is kind of an interesting situation. Um, and, and in actuality, it's a little bit more than that. It's more like you have genes from your grandfather on one of the chromosomes and genes from your grandmother on the other chromosome. Because remember, the sperm from your father is created by his DNA. So if you're going to be, when you're born, okay, the sperm from your father is created from his genetics, which means that he's getting a combination of his father's DNA and a combination of his mother's DNA. So in actuality, if you're talking about your own DNA, it would be part your grandfather's chromosome and part your grandmother's chromosome. Okay? And we'll look at this in much greater detail uh, in, in future slides. Right? Now we already talked about sister chromatids, so you remember that they're held together with a centromere, right? but these homologs are not held together with a centromere, but rather they're held together with cohesion. Right, the attraction of water molecules. But it happens to be enough attraction that it can result in this hybridization of chromosomes. It, the result in this breaking of uh, the chromosome linkage and swapping of material. So here's better, instead of watching my hands, here's just kind of a better diagram. Homologous chromosomes, this could be chromosome number one, two, whatever, it doesn't really matter they line up, they pair up. So dad's chromosome number one, mom's chromosome number one. Okay. The inside sister chromatids are going to swap in, swap chunks. Now this could happen all along the inside. It could happen up here in the P region. It can happen down here in the Q region. It could happen multiple times. It could happen two, three times in the Q region and once in the P region. Or it could not happen at all. Okay. And that's the interesting th thing about meiosis and crossing over is it doesn't have to happen and it's not really predictive. So we can't actually say, well, your chromosome number one is going to cross over at, you know, the Q from between the Q2 and 5 region, it's going to cross over. We, we can't make those predictions, which is great because that just allows for even more genetic diversity. Right? But in the end, after that crossing over event has occurred, one of the sister chromatids of each of the homolo homologous pairs is going to be a hybrid. Right? All right, so metaphase one, same kind of thing as metaphase in mitosis, except for now the homologs are lining up on the metaphase plate and they're lining up as pairs. And so, And when they line up as pairs, the chance that one pair is on one side and one pair is on the other side is purely random. So the orientation of the homologs is completely random. And it, it results in many, many different combinations. That's called independent assortment. So not only do you have crossing over, where you can get hybrid chromosomes. Then you also get this independent assortment because you don't know which chromosome you're going to inherit you know, from what, what parent, either dad, mom, um, their chromosome. And so uh, it makes for much higher diversity when you, when you look at sexual reproduction in organisms. So here you can just see independent assortment, and you can see that you have some chromosomes that have crossing over, others that do not, and in this case you might have, let's say the purple ones are maternal chromosomes and the green are paternal. 
all of dads are on one side, all of moms are on the other side. And it's showing three, but we could say, you know, if we're talking about humans, there's going to be 23 of these pairs. In this case, you know, these three are arranged a little bit different. One maternal, one paternal is swapped. Okay, same thing, same thing down here. So you got lots of different arrangements that you can have. During metaphase one of meiosis, each joined pair of homologs lines up on the metaphase plate. The orientation of each pair on the spindle axis is random. Either the maternal or paternal homolog may orient toward a given pole. The number of possible chromosome orientations equals 2 raised to the power of the number of chromosome pairs. In this hypothetical cell with three chromosome pairs, eight 2 to the third possible orientations exist. Each orientation produces gametes with different combinations of parental chromosomes. Okay, so there you can see a quick way to figure out how many possible combinations you have. So if we take humans, for example, we are diploid, so we have two chromosomes, one from your mom, one from your dad, but we have 23 different chromosomes. So we can just raise two to the 23rd power, and that's how many possible combinations we have in humans. It comes out to be about mm, a little over 8 million possible combinations, which is amazing. Okay? And this is why no two individuals are the same unless they came from the same fertilized egg as identical twins. So there's 8 million combinations from just chromosome arrangement. On top of that, that's not accounting for the genetic diversity that you get when you look at crossing over occurring also. And so the combinations from crossing over you know, expands it to millions and millions, okay? hundreds of millions of possible combinations, if not more than that. Okay? Now, you can figure this out for all kinds of organisms. They don't have to be diploid. Right? They don't have to have two chromosomes. If they're tetraploid, you could say, all right, there's four chromosomes raised to whatever power, however many different chromosomes they have. Okay, and it's an easy way to kind of figure out their possible combinations um, of different organisms. Okay, anaphase, it proceeds just like anaphase and mitosis. The homologs are removed or are separated from each other, so the, the cohesive forces are divided, okay, and homologs move to separate poles. In telophase, those Chromosomes get a new nuclear envelope that forms around them. Um, a lot of times they'll kind of uh, disassociate it with histones for a little bit. It, and it really depends on the cell and the individual. I shouldn't say the cell because it's occurring in germline cells. But the individual or species, um, it depends. Because what can happen is... A new nuclear envelope can form around it, and then it might enter the G1 phase for a little bit. So the two cells that were created from the single cell might go into the G1 phase just to increase their size a little bit. Right? And it really depends on the organism how much time is spent or even if time is spent at all. So here you can see how that's going on. Um, so there are... You know, uh, microscope images of the chromosomes condensing, okay, the, chrom the homologs pairing up together, and so you can see it looks like there's two sets of chromosomes attached to each other, and that's because there are. Uh, <clears throat> and then they li line up on that metaphase plate, so crossing over is going to occur here, independent assortment is going to occur here, and then normal uh, division is going to occur here and here. So these homologs are separated, move to the poles, they you know, condense into kind of a nuclei. Sometimes a nuclear envelope will form around them and they'll uncondense, they'll disassociate with histones, uh, and then they'll pinch off. If it's a you know, animal cell, a cleavage furrow will form and you'll get two cells. If it's a plant cell, you'll get a cell plate that runs between them. And so <clears throat> After meiosis one, 
you'll then enter a interface often it'll enter an interface like I said before so it'll go into a G1 phase for just a little bit and it's not a true interface because the S phase is skipped there's no DNA replication after meiosis 1 and often um, it's just a little bit of cell growth possibly um, the making of new maybe mitochondria, maybe some more ribosomes, these kind of things. Um, just it depends. It really depends on on the organism, and then they'll enter into meiosis two. Right? And so once they enter into meiosis two, okay, this is going to be the process by which the sister chromatids are separated. And so when we come back. I'll talk about meiosis two to kind of get at you know how, what are the steps in meiosis two and then some other factors that go along with crossing over and the differences that you would find between meiosis and mitosis. Okay. So next time meiosis two.